Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehayas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News tonight. The repercussions of this conflict for the entire region is absolutely profound and very concerning for the African continent. That's Professor Linda Heineken, a conflict specialist at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, on the prospects that Sudan's conflict could spread to the country's neighbors. Details coming up also. Nigerian security forces have rescued 58 people who were abducted by gunmen. And Ugandan security forces have arrested six people accused of building explosive devices. These stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. The warring military factions in Sudan began talks in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia on Saturday. Saudi authorities said initial negotiations would focus on ending the fighting to allow delivery of relief supplies and restoration of essential services. Conflict erupted in Sudan more than three weeks ago and has so far claimed hundreds of lives and injured more than 4,000 people. Darren Taylor reports. Analysts say the fighting is about much more than disagreements over Sudan's transition to democracy. We must remember here that it's not just about political power and who is in control, but also control of the economy. Both of these armed forces have got control of different segments of their economy. Conflict specialist at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, Professor Lindy Heineken, says the talks won't be easy because both sides have much to lose and because so many other countries have vested interests in Sudan. She, like many analysts, says Sudan Army Chief Abdel Fattah al-Buran appears to be supported by Egypt, while RSF leader Mohamed Dagalo, known as Hemeti, is closely allied with United Arab Emirates and with mercenaries linked to Russia. The rapid support forces have been supported by the Wagner Group, so they are both Western and Russian alliances. There is gold and natural resources, and it makes it a very messy mix in order to resolve this conflict. Dagalo has often spoken about his cooperation with Russia's Wagner mercenaries, who control several gold mines in Sudan. Heineken says the RSF and Wagner are collaborating to sell the gold in Dubai in the UAE. The conflict has so far displaced thousands of Sudanese, many who fled into neighboring countries. These places, says Heineken, are battling insurgencies led by Islamic militants. All these countries are weak states, and we also know that whenever there is a civil war of this case, it just undermines development and undermines security. So the repercussions of this conflict for the entire region is absolutely profound and very concerning for the African continent. Senior researcher at Johannesburg's Africa Institute, Dr. Chek Achu is particularly concerned about Chad and the Central African Republic, CAR. They share borders with Sudan's Darfur region, and conflict there has often spilled into Chad and CAR. If the talks show even just a hint of failure, says Achu, Africa and the international community must move fast to prevent a much bigger tragedy. If the country cannot protect its citizens, then the continent or even global institutions like the UN have got the power invested in them by the Charter of the UN and the Constitutive Bank of the African Union to ensure that citizens in that particular country, in this case Sudan, are protected. Heineken says both the RSF and the Sudan army are powerful military forces capable of sustaining a long conflict. We're definitely looking at a kind of an asymmetric warfare that is going to take place. And unless these forces can agree, like we had in South Africa during our transition towards a democracy, to integrate into a national armed forces, then we're not going to see peace. And I cannot see... She says an enduring conflict in Sudan and beyond would undoubtedly strengthen terror organizations 
with potentially terrible consequences for Africa and the world. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. Nigerian security forces have rescued 58 people who were abducted by gunmen in central Kogi state near the capital Abuja. Nigerian police say one of those abducted was killed during the rescue operation and the kidnappers escaped. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. Police authorities in a statement Sunday said the rescue mission was part of operations by security forces to fight violent crimes, rescue victims, and nab offenders around Abuja, the federal capital territory, FCT, and neighboring states. The captives were held in a forest in Gegu district of nearby Kogi state. Police said kidnappers fought back hard as security forces arrived, but say security agents overpowered and injured many of them before they fled, leaving the victims behind. Abuja Police Commissioner Haruna Garba told VOA Verfund that a total of 58 abductees were rescued in the Gegu raid and two others late last week. Police said one of the abductees who sustained an injury during the Gegu rescue operation died on the spot. They said the other kidnapped victims rescued will be reunited with their families after medical exams. Nigeria is battling a range of security issues, but kidnapping is among the most challenging. Abuja has maintained relative calm despite states not far from it battling armed violence, including more frequent kidnap for ransom attacks. Security analyst Senator Irebu says the general insecurity can be traced back to a jailbreak last year in Abuja that freed hundreds of criminals, including terror suspects. It's still linked to the issue of um, so many unresolved uh, cases of insecurity, you know, so many. No one leads to the other. There are a lot of sleeper cells around, you know, waiting to activate at any moment. So what you have now is a mix, multi mix um, from terrorist groups and criminal groups. Irebu says to address the problem, authorities must change their approach to security matters. They've not yet uh, change their tactics, they always be reactive. The government need to take more proactive measures. Uh, most most people are uh, under the excruciating pain of the poor economy. People sleep without food, so they should be able to sleep to feel themselves. Nigerian president-elect Bola Tinubu will be sworn in on May 29th. His predecessor has been widely criticized for not securing the country enough. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Ugandan security forces have arrested six people accused of building explosive devices. Police connected the men to online calls for a nationwide anti-government protest. Halima Atumani has more from Kampala, Uganda. Ugandan police say a joint security operation that started Sunday night and ended Monday morning netted six suspected terrorists. The operation in the central Akiso district involved the police, the head of military intelligence, the army and Uganda's internal security organization. Luke Oyesijiri, the Kampala Metropolitan Police Deputy Spokesperson, has more details. A suspected terrorists had uh, a camp here where they were assembling and uh, making IEDs. Uh, the suspect we have will be taken to one of our police stations for uh, more interviews and interrogations to ascertain the aim and uh, probably their targets. The arrested suspects were identified as Hamidu Sechide, Muhammad Kaliango, Abdu Katumba, Arafat Sali, Manuel Asimwe and Hamidu Muyondi. According to the deputy spokesperson, one suspect, Muyondi, was mistakenly shot at when a police officer forgot to put a safety pin on and his gun discharged a bullet striking the suspect in the leg. The injury is said to be minor. 
The police said the suspects wanted to cause mayhem in Kampala following online posts calling for Ugandans to come out in large numbers and join anti-government protests. The social media posts had symbols and hashtags normally used by the National Unity Party, the main opposition group to Ugandan President Yoram Seveni. However, when called by VOA, party officials said they were not behind the posts and chose not to make a comment about the arrest. Police have not filed formal charges against the six terror suspects. They are expected to do so after a thorough investigation while they attempt to find any collaborators who may be connected to the six. Halima Asmani for VA News, Kampala, Uganda. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Senegalese opposition figure Osman Sonko failed to turn up today for his appeal in a defamation case that could jeopardize his run for president next year. He was given a six-month suspended sentence. According to local media, Sonko warned last night he would no longer respond to court summons without guarantees for his safety. Sonko came third in the 2019 presidential election and intends to run again in 2024, but faces two court cases that could ruin his candidacy. For more on what this means for Sonko's candidacy, VOA's Douglas Mpuga reached Rene Lake, director of Seneplas.com, an information portal on Senegal that partners with reputable newspapers. I think it is more like a political uh, move, what I will call a political move of victimization. And uh, in politics, that works in uh, in general. In Senegal, it did work for a lot of uh, political uh, leaders. So more you present yourself as a victim of the abuse of the state, of the government, of the uh, political party in power, more you get the sympathy of the population. And I think that uh, this kind of uh, strategy uh, Sonko has, a lot of politicians use that uh, strategy in uh, Senegal. And in his case also, obviously, uh, because he has so many issues uh, with the judicial system, one can say that he may have uh, some point in terms of uh, uh, being somehow a victim of some kind of uh, harassment. Uh, he mentions uh, that he's concerned about his security. How serious is that assertion? I, I don't know, because so far we haven't seen any uh, situation uh, uh, we will uh, suggest uh, something like that, except the fact that indeed there was a, he did claim that he was uh, harassed inside the, the, the court the last time he was there. The, uh, some of the, the allegation was he have, uh, they tried to poison him or something like that, but nothing concrete. Uh, came out of that uh, investigation from at least the police uh, uh, perspective. So we're not really uh, sure about uh, this allegation. And now, as it comes to the security of the, the city and when he moved from his home to, to the court, I don't think we can uh, say that uh, there is a serious uh, danger for his security, except, of course, where we, uh, the entire world did say the, the police... Uh, uh, breaking his car, uh, to pull him out of his car in order to put him in a police security car. So because the government didn't want to take any chance, didn't want something bad to happen to him. So some people argue the opposite, saying, oh, in any case, the government so far had protect him, especially when he was going to the court. Now that he hasn't appeared for his case, the appeal, what do you think becomes of the appeal? Maybe, will it survive? We're going to see. It's it going to depend on what the judgment comes to at the end of the day. But for him not going there, the only main implication, at least from a judicial standpoint, is his lawyer cannot speak for him because he's not there. So basically, it's going to be all about the show of the procurer and the prosecutor. And so whatever the judge decides, that's going to be the final uh, decision of the court on his case. So, so far, is not something who question his participation to the election. If uh, the first in- instance, uh, the first judgment is confirmed, now if the judgment is uh, stronger, and especially the, the penalties, that could make him uh, uh, not uh, eligible to uh, participate to the presidential election. But that we don't know yet. We have to wait for the result of this uh, procedure. 
talking about his chances of uh, running for president, he still has another case. Yes, uh, and this is in a few days. It's the 16th of May, and that one he has to be uh, to be uh, to be there. There is no way he cannot uh, be on the uh, at the court that day. So it's certainly going to be a very uh, tense uh, uh, moment. And in that case, he's uh, accused of uh, raping uh, someone, and so that obviously a more uh, serious and more difficult case because in one hand, it's a way, way more serious uh, problem accusation, but in another, in another hand, is also something where the public opinion is not necessarily against him, at least in a large uh, part of the public opinion, because they really felt that there is some kind of uh, a conspiration uh, created by the government or at least some allies of the government around that, uh, that case. That was uh, René Lake, director of Seneplus.com, an information portal on Senegal that partners with reputable newspapers. He spoke with Douglas Mpuga from Washington. Gunmen have shot dead a journalist in the capital of Cameroon's restive northwest region, Bamenda, the third journalist to be killed in the country this year. Colleagues and family of Anye Nde Nso, bureau chief for a weekly newspaper, The Advocate, say he was killed at a bar in what they believe was a targeted killing. Moki Edwin Kinzeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. Cameroon journalist says scores of civilians and reporters on Monday visited the Bamenda residence of reporter Anyan Denso to sympathize with his family. Nso was killed in Bamenda, capital of Cameroon's northwest region, on Sunday night. Jude Muma, local president of the Cameroon Association of English-Speaking Journalists, Kamasej, says he led a delegation of several dozen reporters that visited Nso's family. He spoke via telephone from Bamenda. I speak to you from the family compound and the family in great pain. And Yandelso, as a baby, the mother of the baby is uncontrollable. And Yandelso's family is in pain. Members are in pain. Colleagues of the journalism profession are also here in pain that An Yandelso is no more. Cameroon Media reports that scores of civilians in the southwest region also visited the head office of the Advocate newspaper to sympathize with colleagues of the killed reporter. The newspaper's publisher, Tayang Enobika Tabe, says so was professionally upright and good-humored and says he cannot understand why someone would kill him. Tayang says he had a long telephone conversation with Nso just hours before the reporter was killed. Two hours after... I edited his stories, finished talking to him. I had a call that he was shot. This guy was an aspiring young journalist, full of the spirit to work and to serve. A very humble young man is gone. It's a big loss to the Cameroon press. I use the possibility again to condemn the killings of journalists. In fact, they are soft targets. So sad. Charles Embola, publisher of Volcanic Times newspaper, says his organization is investigating Nsor's death and has spoken with several witnesses and officials in Bamenda. From every indication, it was more of a targeted killing because the guys came in on a bike and went straight and shot him on the chest. And our colleague died on the spot. No other person in that public space was a target. It was not clear whether the killing was related to the ongoing battle between Cameroon government troops and separatists in the northwest and southwest regions. Separatist forces are trying to split off the regions where most people speak English as an independent state from French-speaking majority Cameroon. The International Crisis Group reports that 6,000 people have been killed since 2017. So far, no one has claimed responsibility for the death of Nso. Cameroon's military says Nso was killed by separatist fighters, but gives no possible motives. Separatists on social media denied involvement in his killing, while a separatist leader, Capo Daniel, said Nso was the victim of a case of mistaken identity. Nso is the third journalist to be killed in Cameroon in 2023. Earlier this year, investigative journalist Martinez Zogu 
and radio presenter Jean-Jacques Olabebe were killed in the capital Yaoundé, Cameroonian journalists say they remain fearful and have reported killings and threats on journalists to the police. Speaking during World Press Freedom Day activities in Yaoundé, Cameroon's communication minister René Emmanuel Sadi assured reporters of government protection in the exercise of their duties. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. During a speech he made, Tunisian President Kais Saeed rejected the conditions that come with a potential loan from the in International Monetary Fund, IMF, calling them dictates. When asked what the alternative is, he responded to rely on ourselves. Reactions to the speech as well as uh, actions taken by Tunisian officials before and after that seem to contradict its intention, causing confusion. Is there a deal or there is no deal? Sarah Yerkes, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Middle East program, discussed this contradicting positions with VOA senior analyst Mohamed El Shinawi. I think Saeed's position is not that surprising. He has long rejected what he calls foreign interference in Tunisian's affairs. And he really has never been fully on board with the types of reforms that the IMF is requesting that Tunisia undertake. But his position is also not clear at all. He has not clarified how the Tunisian government can possibly find the funds at home to address the massive economic crisis facing Tunisia. European governments, especially that of Italy, which has been lobbying for IMF loan with increasing anti-migrant policy, and lately the European Union and the US, whose respective top diplomat publicly urged Tunisia to sign the loan. Additionally, the big three international credit rating agencies have cited the lack of an IMF loan as the main factor behind their downgrading of Tunisia's sovereign bond ratings in recent months, and the resulting poor credit ratings have hampered imports for basic and vitally needed goods like wheat in Tunisia. Would that change Tunisian president's position? No. Both the United States and the European Union have been clear for over a year the IMF deal is really the only way out of Tunisia's economic crisis and that they are not willing to fund Tunisia until that deal is signed. And the Arab states also have said that they will support Tunisia, but only after an IMF deal is reached. So I think Saeed has really known for quite some time how crucial this deal is. Nevertheless, he does continue to adopt policies related to IMF and elsewhere that run counter to both Tunisia's needs and to his own political future. Following the president's speech, Tunisia's Minister of Economy and Planning, Samit Saeed, and the governor of the CPT, Marwan Abbasi, were in Washington heading an official delegation during the World Bank and IMF spring meetings. This signaled that Saeed's rhetoric against IMF wasn't necessarily definitive, with some speculating that he was merely using strong language to press for better terms from an IMF loan, while others questioned whether the president's anti-IMF policy preference was being undermined by his own officials. What's your take on that? This really shows just how dysfunctional the Tunisian government is right now, with Saeed making public statements that actively undermine the efforts of his own government. I think both Samir Saeed and Marwan Abbasi understand how important the IMF deal is for Tunisia, and they're really just kind of plowing ahead despite Kai Saeed's inflammatory rhetoric. But I honestly don't think that Kai Saeed is savvy enough to make this statement as a way to get better terms on the IMF deal. Instead, I think it's really just the latest example of him trying to shift the blame for Tunisia's woes away from him and onto someone else. And unfortunately, this represents just the latest example of him taking actions that are not well thought out and that really have the potential to hurt the change goal. Is he relying on financing from the Gulf countries, for example? I think he hopes for financing from the Gulf countries, but the Gulf countries have been clear alongside Europe and the United States that they are not going to support Tunisia until an IMF deal is signed. There's no one so far that has said that they are willing to fund Tunisia before an IMF deal is signed. So he's really in a difficult position. That was Sarah Yerkes, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Middle East Program, speaking with VOA's Mohamed El-Shenawi. 
And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Barrow, and our engineer, Cornelius Tanner, thanks for choosing the Voice of America.